He asked me this morning, did I want to have the last song before we began, big or quieter? And I said, big. Well, it feels like I should come out like this. (laughs) Good morning. Welcome to worship on this beautiful, beautiful February morning. This is our time. And wasn't it beautiful this morning when the sun came up? Maybe you weren't even alive then, but it was a beautiful sunrise. And it's a beautiful day with everything washed clean and all the weeds coming up and I love Arizona at this time of year. I'm Pastor Deborah Lerner. I'm the senior pastor here at Shepherd of the Hills. If you are worshiping with us online, we're really glad to have you. And I want to to know that this is a communion Sunday, and we would love to have you participate with us. If you would like to do that, just go and gather a few simple elements so you'll be ready. You need some crackers or a tortilla or some bread and a little juice or a little water, and then you'll be ready when we come to that part of the service. If this is your very first time with us, we're especially glad that you chose to come here, and we hope that you're blessed by this time. Please let us know if there's some way we can help you as you find your way here. Look for somebody that looks like they know what they're doing and ask them. You know, If they have a name tag, sometimes they know something, so you could try that too. We do invite anyone who considers themselves to be a newcomer to stop by our Welcome Center and pick up a little bag that looks like this, just as a thank you. We're glad you came. Even if you have been here a few times, if you have not picked one of these up, please pick one up and take it home. It'll remind you that you've been here. We want you to think of us again and fondly and want to come back, and we're glad you came this time. It is helpful to us if you will fill out the Connections card that you received inside the papers that you were given as you arrived. On the back, we have an opportunity to write down prayer requests or comments. If there's something that you want us to know about the service or about something that you need, please take advantage of this little card. Fill it out and drop it into the basket by each of the doors as you exit later on. Our prayer is always that you find the things that you need this morning. I don't know what those are. But you know, and God knows, and those things will be available here through the one who calls us here, the host of our worship, Jesus our Christ. He hosts the worship, he hosts the table that we will, the, of communion that we will partake of later on, and uh, he is the source of all good things. So as we worship, may you have a powerful experience of the risen Christ and be given those things that you need. We begin every service in the same way, reminding ourselves what God thinks of us. So I invite you to remind yourself now. This is from the first chapter of Ephesians. I am chosen. I am blessed. I am loved. You know, that's the truth. And it's true for the people around you, uh, even the ones you don't especially like. So I invite you to stand and put a big smile on your face like you like all of them and say to somebody around you, you are chosen and you are blessed. And you are loved. (laughs) And then before you sit down, let's say the same thing to our online guests. And we do that by looking at that camera over there and say to them, you are chosen. You are blessed. And you are loved. You may be seated. Our mission candle today shines in in honor of a couple of really special occasions. It shines to honor Ernestine Reed on her 91st birthday coming up this week. Happy birthday. She's right over here. And it shines to honor our youngest member, the other end of the scale, Sam Lerner, who turned 39 years old on Wednesday. And he's right over here. And we say happy birthday, Sam, from Love Mom. And anybody that isn't clued in yet, that's my son, and I'm Mom. Everybody is invited for our birthday cupcake uh, in the Fellowship Hall following this service. We brought tons of little teeny cupcakes, so come and have one with us. Now let us prepare our hearts for worship with our prelude.
Good morning and welcome to church. I'm the Reverend Bill Cutter. I am the liturgist this morning, and I ask you to rise if, as you are comfortable for the call to worship. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. The risen Christ is with you. Praise the Lord. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to church. My name is Ken Goodenberger, and I'm the music director here at Shepherd of the Hills. And we invite you to remain standing as we sing our opening hymn, When Morning Gilds the Skies. Morning, church. I am Pastor Daniel Gomez, associate pastor. Please remain standing and join me in the opening prayer, which will also be on the screen. God of light and love, we gather to proclaim your goodness, to glorify your name, and to offer our lives for your service. We confess we have often strayed from your intentions. We have sometimes allowed our fear to keep us. We have listened to the world and not to you. Forgive us, we pray. Renew us and strengthen us. Enable us to worship you in spirit and in truth. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. The scripture lesson for today comes from Matthew, the sixth chapter, verses 25 through 33. It can be found in your pew Bibles on page six in the New Testament section. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life what you eat or what you will drink or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not more valuable than they? And which of you, by worrying, can add a single hour to your span of life? 
Or why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not clothed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? Therefore do not worry, saying, What will we eat, or what will we drink? What will we wear? For it is the Gentiles who seek all these things, and indeed your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. The word of God for the people of God.
Man, that was awesome, wasn't it? That was just such a good, good anthem. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Would you pray with me? Now let the words of my mouth be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. Well, today we come to the end of our little journey with John Ortberg. If you want to walk on water, you've... There we go. you got to get out of the boat. I'm sad to come to the end of this. I should say that the classes will go on for another week. We had to shrink down by a week to make room for some other things, so this will be the last message from the pulpit. But the classes will go on, so don't don't be afraid of that. Uh, I want to just spend a little time kind of running through where we've been with this series as we bring it to our close. We, we began with that wonderful story of the disciples of Jesus out on the Sea of Galilee. A storm has come up, and they have fought that storm all night long. And about 3 o'clock in the morning, Jesus comes walking across the sea. And they see him, but they do not recognize him. And they're terrified. They're already terrified by the storm. But seeing this apparition, it must be a ghost. Why would it be Jesus? They can't imagine that it would be him. And he spoke to calm them. He said, don't be afraid. It is I. But we talked about how that it is I really is a little different in the original language. It's more like he said, do not be afraid. I am. I am. And when he said that, he claimed for himself the name, the holiest name for God in all of Scripture. When Moses was trying not to do what God wanted him to do and lead the children out of Egypt, and they were having this back and forth, Moses said to God, so who am I supposed to say sent me if they ask? And God answered, I am. But it's much bigger than that in the original language. It means I am, but it also means I will be who I will be. And it means I cause to be what I cause to be. And when Jesus said that about himself, I am, He was giving them a glimpse of who he really was and is. And he gave them that same glimpse by walking across the water toward them. We talked about Peter and how his heart was so eager to jump out of the boat and go to Jesus. But how he waited. He asked and waited. He said, Lord, if it's you, bid me come. And Jesus said, come. And Peter stepped over that boat and over the edge of the boat and walked out to Jesus. Both things are important to notice there, that he was eager, that he was ready to go if his master called him, and that he waited until he was called to go. And we saw that he was able to do it, that he was able to walk on water in a terrible storm with horrible waves as long as he kept his focus on Jesus. When he noticed the wind, which wasn't new, it was there all along, he lost his focus and he got scared. And when he got scared, he started to sink. He cried out and Jesus reached out and pulled him out saying, Oh, ye of little faith, why did you doubt? For Peter, that whole thing was a life-changing moment. For the rest of his life, he would know two things. He would know that he could do anything God called him to do. And he would also know in the depth of his heart that Jesus could rescue him from the worst imaginable situation. He could never get in a spot so bad that Jesus couldn't reach down and pull him out. The other men in the boat had had a powerful experience. It had a huge impact. They'd seen what happened, but it didn't happen to them. And it didn't, they didn't experience it the way Peter did. They saw enough to realize who Jesus was and who Jesus is and who Jesus always will be, but it didn't become heart knowledge as it became for Peter. 
And then we spend a little time considering how each person who follows Jesus is given gifts, a gift, multiple gifts, not so we can go around saying, hey, I have this gift, look at me, and not for our personal benefit. We're given gifts so that we can participate with God in making the kingdom of God real and visible on earth. And we noted that each one of us, absolutely every last one of us, is on a mission from God. That every last one of us has a calling from God to participate in that making real the kingdom. If we'll just step out of the boat, if we'll step away from the things that make us feel safe and secure and comfortable so that we can move toward whatever Jesus has for us to do and be. Ortberg writes, hope got Peter out of the boat, trust held him up, and fear sank him. Everything hinged on whether he was focused on the Savior or on the storm. And that very same thing is true more than 2,000 years later. In 2024, it's true for you. It's true for me. When we gather up our courage to step out of the boat and leave our security behind, when we start moving toward whatever it is that God calls us to do, everything hinges on whether we are focused on the Savior or whether we're focused on the storm of the moment because there's always one, isn't there? This journey of faith is not really about what you're capable of doing. It's not really about what I'm capable of doing in our own power. It's about what God might want to do through you or through me. And it's about coming to trust that God can do it, that God is capable of doing whatever God wants to do with each one of us. In the words of Paul in scripture, we are assured, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Now, if you're in a certain place, you might have a weird idea about what that means. I can do all things. I can get a Tesla. That's what I'd like to do. I can accumulate all the money that I want to accumulate. That can do all things. I can sing like Taylor Swift. Don't bet on it. But that's not what it's about. It is a reminder that you and I don't have to depend on our own power to respond to God's calling. We can trust that in God's power and with Christ in us, our efforts are going to be fruitful. Our part is to stay focused on Christ. So as I was writing the sermon, I said, so what are you focused on, Deborah? And then I thought, well, what are you focused on, folks? What are we focused on? And exactly how are are we to keep our focus on Jesus, who's no longer present and visible in the flesh? Don't you think it was easier for them? They could reach out and touch him. And isn't it especially hard when the storms of life are raging and we may be struggling to even stand up? Ortberg writes, how do we go about developing minds that focus on Christ even in the middle of storms. Now, I want you to notice what he's saying. How do we develop our minds so they focus on Christ? We, you know, I don't think too much about my mind, do you? Once I graduated from school, I'm not in the business of training it every day. They just are, right? And sometimes I think I just let my mind wander wherever it wants to go. So sometimes it goes over here and that's helpful. And sometimes it goes over there and it's not so helpful. And sometimes it's just a million miles away. And sometimes I think I feed my mind Twinkies and Ho's when I sit in front of the television and watch inane repetitious programs. Do you ever do that? Or maybe you watch sports programs to, uh, to the end of time. Or maybe you play games on your phone. You probably thought I didn't know about that, huh? (laughs) It's the the weirdest people get stuck on those games on the phone, right? I was listening to the radio the other day, and Janet Yellen was on the radio. You know who she is, right? 
she's that, that person who speaks in such stilted terms and she just seems so precise and she seems so controlled and measured. And on, on the radio the other day, she confessed that she was addicted to Candy Crush. <laughs> and I thought, man, that is probably not good for a mind. I mean, we just let our, let them go wherever we want. We're pretty cavalier about our minds. We act like it doesn't matter what we feed them, but it does. It matters a very great deal because you are what you think and what you think is shaped by what you hear, by what you see, by what you read, by what you write, by what you allow yourself to dream about. And you have control over all of that. Did you realize that? Frank Laubach is a sociologist, education, and missionary to the Philippines. And they went to the Philippines. They had a number of children. I don't even know how many they started with, but things started happening. He was not successful at first in that ministry. And three of their children died because of the hardships they were facing. And his wife decided she was not going to allow any more of her children to die, so she came back to the States, leaving him there alone. But he felt called to stay. And so he found himself praying desperately, God, drive me out of myself and come and take possession of me and think thy thoughts in my mind. It was a life-changing moment for him. He devoted the rest of his life trying to to live every moment in conscious awareness of the presence of God. And as he did that, he developed a deep friendship with God. He made some recommendations that I, I put some of them into your bulletin. If you'll reach for the little piece of paper that looks like this, it has the Lenten schedule on one side, and on the other it says focusing on Christ day by day. I want you to take this home and put it where you will see it and read it sometimes this week, and maybe for a while. He says, these are helpful things. Practice double vision as you glance at the person seated near you, no matter where you are, maybe the person in the line at Fry's. Try to see that person not only as he or she is, which may be annoying in the moment, but as Christ sees that person. It makes such a difference. When you come to the chair, when the table, put an extra chair for your meals and remind yourself of his promise, I am with you always. Take a, put a picture of Christ or a cross or a word of scripture right by the bed so you'll see it the last thing at night and first thing in the morning. Let God have the first word of the day and the last word of the day. I I think those might be life changing. They're simple, but But if we did them with some regularity, it really would help us focus. We also help our minds focus on Christ by meditating on the word with a little w that points to the word who is the one, Jesus. We meditate on scripture. We go to it. We read it. We turn it around in our minds. We ask God to give us a word for this moment. And all of those things, reading scripture, meditating on it, even memorizing it, train our mind to focus on the one who can make us able to walk on water. And I gave you several possibilities for scriptures, too, so that you can try this out at home. Let's just look together at the last. These are all so rich. The last one. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. You could spend a long time living with that scripture. So try that out this week. And the other thing that we need to do to really focus on Christ is to commit ourselves to worshiping with all our heart, And doing it regularly, because above all other things that we do, worship is the time when we intentionally come for an encounter with God. We set the time aside just for God. It's where we come and hear scripture and music that touch the mind and the heart and teach us who God is and what God does and lead us toward deeper trust in God. 
Worship is a place to discover again and again how much bigger God is than we imagined God to be last year or last week or yesterday. Every day there is a discovery of how huge God is. Our, the God we worship is the great I am, the great I will be who I will be. From the, the tiniest subatomic particle to the farthest reaches of the cosmos. The Christ whom we encounter, through whom we encounter God most directly, is the one who said to the men in the boat, don't be afraid, I am one God, three persons, all beyond our power to imagine. And encountering this God in worship can shift our perspective. Ortberg writes, I need to worship because without it I can forget that I have a big God beside me and live in fear. I need to worship because without it I can forget his calling and begin to live in a spirit of self-preoccupation. I need to worship because without it I lose a sense of wonder and gratitude and plod through life with blinders on. I need to worship because my natural tendency is towards self-reliance and stubborn independence. I will tell you, I could have written that last sentence myself. The men in the boat, after they saw Jesus walking on the water, and saw Peter walking on the water. When Jesus came and got in the boat, they worshipped because they needed to. They worshipped and said, truly, you are the Son of God. And their perspective was shifted forever. Our perspective can be shifted too. We can become more and more people who trust in the promise of that scripture that you heard today. Wasn't it sweet? That if we just prioritize the kingdom, if we keep our focus on the one in whom the kingdom came and the one in whom the kingdom comes and comes until it's fully here, if we do that, everything else will fall into place. John Ortberg ends the book this way. When human beings get out of the boat, they're never quite the same. Their worship is never quite the same. Their world is never quite the same. Whatever the results, whether they sink or swim, something will have changed. That's true for you. From this point on, for the rest of your life, every time you walk on the water, each time you trust God and seek to discern and obey his calling on your life, your God will get bigger and your worship will grow deeper and richer and stronger. And then the final admonition from him and from me, if you want to walk on water, you've got to. May it be so for all of us. Amen. Song of response is a short one, but a pithy one through it all. Holy Spirit, may we continue to remain mindful that it is with the Word of God in our hearts and in our minds that will give us the understanding of who our God is, that will give us the notion when we are to trust 
and remain with God. We are grateful, Holy Jesus, for your act of obedience unto the cross because of your obedience we are now able to come before the very throne of our Creator God at any time, any place, anywhere. You have paid the price on our behalf, and we are grateful. This morning we pray for those that are celebrating birthdays, for those that are suffering the loss of a loved one, for those that are being challenged with decisions that need to be made. And we trust. We trust in Jesus because from the beginning to the end, you remain and you will always be the Alpha and the Omega, and there is no other God like you. You know our thoughts and even our needs, even before we begin to pray. And for that, we are grateful. Amen. Each week we share information about one of the ministries of the church so you know how and where your gifts are being used. Today we feature a prayer ministry which undergirds all of us and all of our ministry with prayer. A group of intercessors regularly receive prayer requests from your connections cards through the website and through the office and hold your concerns in prayer throughout the week. Another group has been trained for personal ministry, and one is available after the 10 a.m. worship service and the 4 p.m. worship services every week. There is a group which meets periodically to plan new prayer initiatives. They provide materials for use at our prayer labyrinth and from time to time give us an opportunity to participate in a prayer vigil when we lift up our prayer steadily over a period of time. Thank you for your gifts, which undergird our ministry of prayer, and they do touch many lives here and beyond. You are always touching more lives than you realize. Your gifts may be placed in the offering boxes next to each door as you exit. Now please rise as you are comfortable and join us in our song of praise. Let us pray together. God of all goodness and grace, we give you thanks for all you are and all you do. Thank you for gifting us. Thank you for calling us. Thank you for strengthening us so that we might answer your call. In gratitude, we offer these gifts and with them hearts and lives. Use them for your purposes. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. As we come to this table of communion, I always want to be sure that the first thing that I say to you is that you are welcome here if you want to come here. 
This is the table of Christ, the one who welcomed everyone, and here we welcome everyone. This is not Shepherd of the Hills table. It's not the Methodist Church's table. It's his table. And if you are willing to come and receive these gifts and be changed forever by his love, you are welcome to come and partake of this sacrament. When we come to this table, we remember. We remember his last meal with his followers. They came together, and at some point during that meal, he changed it forever. He knew that his end was coming very soon, and they seemed clueless. But he took the simple elements of that meal and changed them so that they have power to speak to us thousands of years later. They have power to bring us into his presence in this generation as well as they did in that generation. He took out the ordinary bread that they were partaking and he blessed it and he broke it. And he offered it to them as he said to them, take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And when the supper was over, he took the cup gave thanks, blessing that cup, and offered it to them as he said to them, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sin. Do this each time you drink it in remembrance of me. When we come to this table, we remember. We remember how he lived his life in love, and we remember how he allowed his life to be poured out as an act of love, to set us free from sin and death and anything else that would keep us from the fullness of what God intends for us to be. And as we remember, we are strengthened, and we become able to offer our lives back as a holy and living sacrifice to be placed with this holy and living sacrifice that has been made on our behalf. O oh, gracious God, Pour out your Holy Spirit on all of us gathered here and those worshiping with us online now and later, and on these gifts here before me and those in each place where people are worshiping. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world, until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at the heavenly banquet. We pray this in his name, and together we then sing the prayer that he taught us as our Miriam dancers interpret it for us in movement.
very, very beautiful amen and amen. I invite those who are assisting with the sacrament, serving the sacrament, to come and join us here at the back of the table. And I invite those who are ushering and sanitizing hands to take up your stations. We will come down in front of each of the sections. The ushers will lead you forward, starting at the front and working toward the back. The pattern will be to come down the center aisle and back around the side aisles, and also from the outside to come and go back up those same aisles. They will direct you as it is appropriate. As you come forward, you will be offered hand sanitizer. Just hold your hands out and they'll squirt your hands. And then come forward to us and we will take a piece of bread, place it in your hand. You will take it and dip it in the cup, which is juice, so that all persons can be included and consume it with a thankful heart. If you prefer individually packaged elements, there are little baskets at each station. Just pick those up and we'll bless them for you and you can take them back. And don't feel bad about that. Some people still are in that place where that feels better. And if you prefer gluten-free, Ken will meet you here at this table with the, gold, the brass chalice, and, and you're welcome to come and receive gluten-free there. The table is prepared.
Pray with me. Eternal God, we give you thanks for this holy mystery in which you have given yourself so completely for us. Enable us to go out into the world in the strength of your steadfast spirit to give ourselves for others. In the name of Jesus, our Christ. Amen. I invite you to stand as you are comfortable for our closing hymn, Shout to the Lord. Let's shout. My Jesus. wonders of your mighty love. My comfort, my shelter, tower of refuge and strength. Let every breath, all that I am, never cease to worship you. Shout to the Lord, all the earth let us sing. Power and I do love that song. It's one of those songs that carries its own anointing. When you sing it, the presence of Jesus, the presence of the Spirit becomes so real. So thank you for singing it with all your heart. We're really glad that you came and worshipped with us. It has been a good morning together. If you are a newcomer, remember to stop by. Daniel, I put it on your side so you get to pick it up. Receive one of the gift bags that we we have as a thank you for joining us. There are many opportunities in your the handouts that you received. I'm going to run through just a few. There's a liturgist training next weekend. If you want to be a liturgist and be a leader of the service, if you'll stay after service just a little bit next week, I'm going to do it after the 4 o'clock and after the 10 o'clock. It won't take long. We'll just go through how that works and what you get and how, how you do that. And so if you'd like to do that, we would love to have you stay. There's also will be a renewal of wedding vows on Sunday, February the 11th at 11.15 in the chapel. So if you want to say I do all over again, sign up and go join Pastor Ron next week. You can also go if you don't sign up. You just won't get a certificate quite so quickly. If you have been married 50 years or longer and you have not celebrated that with us before, we invite you to sign up with the Social Shepherds. They're going to celebrate all of those long-term marriages on Sunday, February the 18th uh, after the service, and we'll recognize those couples in the service. 
If you're new here and you would like to share a meal and conversation with us, please plan to join us for a newcomer lunch on Monday, February the 12th in the Fellowship Hall. Daniel has some flyers that he's going to give you. So if he sees a face that he doesn't know, and he doesn't know very many faces, so forgive him if he gives you the wrong one. He's going to flyer you so that you, you, right? You have a good excuse. I don't have one anymore. But. All right. Personal prayer ministry will be available to you here in the front pew after the service. The prayer minister is here. One last announcement. The men of the church are invited to come Thursday morning at 830 for coffee and donuts and for a presentation on saws. It is a ministry associated with the United Methodist Church that builds ramps for people who have become disabled and who need a ramp and cannot afford to buy one or have it built. It's a marvelous opportunity. If you'd like to hear about that, come to the Fellowship Hall meeting room Thursday at 8.30 a.m. And now, receive the blessing. Now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion and fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and always. Amen.